President Biden and former President Trump both heading to the Texas border on Thursday. The competing trips come as record illegal crossings royal the 2024 election. Joining us now live is NTD's White House correspondent, Iris Tao. Good evening, Iris. So what's on the agenda and how are the different sides responding? Good evening to you, Steve. So President Biden will be in Brownsville, Texas on Thursday to meet with Border Patrol agents and local law enforcement officials and local leaders. Meanwhile, Trump on that same exact day this Thursday will be speaking in Eagle Pass in Texas, which is about just 300 miles away. And the White House says that Biden's main goal there is to call on congressional Republicans to, quote, stop playing politics and now pass the bipartisan border deal that's right now stuck in the Senate and that deal and President Biden has accused President Trump of blocking. Here's what the White House was saying today. Watch. He will reiterate his calls for congressional Republicans to stop playing politics and to provide the funding needed for additional U.S. Border Patrol agents, more asylum officers, fentanyl detection technology and more. The Monday announcement of Biden's trip to the border comes as we are facing a record number of illegal crossings at the southern border and also has President Biden's handling of the border has become one of his worst polling issues in this 2024 presidential election. Former President Trump's campaign responded to Biden's announcement saying Biden's chasing them to the border and also the Border Patrol Union called Biden's trip a little too little too late and saying quote Biden's going to the border now to solely to try to save himself. Meanwhile, Trump, who has vowed to conduct the largest domestic deportation if he gets back at the White House, said this after winning the GOP primary in South Carolina just this past weekend. Watch. People coming in that we just can't, uh, we can't do this. No country could, could sustain what's happening to the United States of America. No country. So we're going to straighten things out. The border is... And Steve, if you remember, the last time that President Biden was at a border town that was in El Paso, Texas, back in January 2023, he visited a migrant center there, but did not appear to see any actual migrants in that place. So it remains to be seen whether this time around he's going to see something different. Steve. Well, our securing the border certainly top on the list for Americans all over the country, uh, both on the interior and those uh, close to that southern border. Indeed, a lot to watch for here. Iris, I want to get your thoughts on, on something else that you mentioned. The, uh, you know, the Michigan primary is happening tomorrow. What can you tell us about that race? Right. So we remember that after South Carolina, Nikki Haley is still refusing to drop out. In fact, today she's already campaigning still in Michigan, saying uh, the biggest takeaway that she got from the South Carolina primary is that 40 percent of voters there did not vote for Trump. So she is staying the race, at least still for now. And let's not but let's not forget that South Carolina was Nikki Haley's home state where she grew up, where she was the governor for some six years. So so South Carolina, with that advantage, already for Haley still showed what we saw last Saturday. And meanwhile, in Michigan, a new polling today showed that Trump is leading Nikki Haley by some 50 points. Trump's polling at around 70 percent, while Nikki Haley's only polling around 20 percent. So let's see what happens on Tuesday when Trump and Haley face off again. Steve. NTD's Iris Tao reporting from the North Lawn of the White House. Thank you, Iris. And as Iris mentioned, Republican primary candidate Nikki Haley has said that she will stay in the presidential race through Super Tuesday, despite her string of losses, including in her home state of South Carolina on Saturday. One analyst says she may be looking ahead to 2028. And joining me now to assess the South Carolina primary results is Libby Krieger of Communications Council. Libby Krieger, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Steve. Of course, Libby, Nikki Haley uh, losing the South Carolina primary election by a little over 20 percentage points, somewhere around 60 to 40. Um, the Koch brothers network uh, backed Americans for Prosperity, stopping its funding of her campaign. What does this tell you about the trajectory of uh, Nikki's uh, candidacy? Even before South Carolina, I think it was pretty clear to most voters that Nikki Haley's path to the presidency and to the nomination was pretty small. Americans for Prosperity Action now pulling out shows us that even her donors are questioning whether she has a chance. I mean, this is her home state. She was governor here for six years. 
and she lost it by about 20 points. I think that's pretty indicative of where the rest of her uh, candidacy is going. And to, to that point, uh, what do you make of the Koch brother, uh, Brothers Network anti-Trump uh, position? Their message has been Trump can't win, but he's won every primary contest and by significant numbers. So what is the source of this animosity, do you think? I think what they're looking at is whether Trump can appeal to moderate voters, because a lot of this is going to come down if Trump versus Biden once again to who those people in the middle vote for. And so I think they're looking and saying maybe he can't appeal to those voters where Biden can or Nikki Haley could have done that better as a Republican. And that's up for debate um, because in all polls right now, Trump in these in these key swing states, Trump is doing better than Biden. So I think as as even though polls are a snapshot in time, there's good reason to think Trump has a fighting chance with his presidency. Libby, why do you think Nikki lost her home state um, and by such a you know, more important question by such such a wide margin. Yeah, and really she, she should have lost by more, but when we look at South Carolina, there's an open primary, meaning independents and Democrat registered voters can also vote, many of them probably who were voting in this Republican primary for Nikki Haley rather than Donald Trump. I think she lost it because she's just off base with where Republican primary voters are at. Uh, we've seen time and time again that they are supportive of the president and even though many moderates don't want to see Trump versus Biden again, that's where the Republican base is. Haley's committed uh, to keeping in the race, at least going through Super Tuesday. Uh, a recent Emerson College poll has her trailing Trump 74 to 24 percent in this Tuesday's Michigan primary, which is before uh, Super Tuesday. Um, could we see her drop out after Michigan? You know, anything is possible. If I was her consultant, I would say stay in until the money runs out because there's really, although it's a small path forward, um, there's not a huge downside. You know, maybe she's looking at trying to be the supposed nominee in 2028 and wants to position herself well. Um, at this point, I wouldn't tell her to drop out until she has no money left in the fund. And to your point there, lastly, um, you know, 2028 in the back of you know, everybody's mind potentially that's at least running right now. What kind of political future do you think she might have after suffering these losses and ramping up her attacks against the presumptive Republican nominee, former President Trump? Now, Steve, I think a lot of that hinges on the question of where the GOP goes from here. Will they revert back to that old GOP with Nikki Haley, the Jeb Bush types, or are they going to continue in the vein of Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump and Vivek Ramaswamy. I think if it reverts back to a lot of the ways of the old GOP, she maybe will be the presumptive nominee or have a really good shot, but that's all gonna depend on where Republican voters go from here. Libby Krieger, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Both the Senate and House of Representatives returned from recess this week, lawmakers facing a partial government shutdown and an impeachment trial. Our Washington correspondent, Louise Martinez, helps us unpack this week's busy legislative agenda. All eyes on Congress this week, in particular House Republicans. Even though the House of Representatives does not reconvene until February the 28th, this Wednesday, for Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, the first order of business will be to meet with his fellow congressional leaders at the White House with President Biden. The Big Four, as they call the party leaders of both chambers of Congress, will meet on Tuesday at the request of President Biden. The president, along with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, are expected to press Speaker Johnson on putting the Senate-approved $95 billion foreign assistance package to a vote on the House floor. On Wednesday, Hunter Biden will testify behind closed doors before the House Oversight and Judiciary Committee as part of the impeachment inquiry against President Joe Biden. After interviewing James Biden last week, the panel will now have the opportunity to depose Hunter Biden. House Republicans will be pressed to produce evidence against the president after longtime FBI informant Alexander Smirnov was indicted for lying to the authorities about Hunter Biden and President Biden's business dealings. It is important to note that the Senate reconvened this Monday, but the House impeachment managers did not present impeachment articles against Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. House Republicans will have to decide when to bring the trial of Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate. Once they do, senators will be sworn in as jurors. 
Last but not least, this Friday is the first government funding deadline. The House of Representatives will have to approve the first four appropriation bills in order to avoid a government shutdown. The funding for the Departments of Agriculture, Veterans Affairs, Energy, Transportation, Housing and Urban Development and other programs account for about 20% of government spending. Five days before a partial government shutdown, there is still no agreement between Republicans and Democrats. The appropriation bills to fund the remaining 80% of the government are due March 8. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at epochtv.com.